Hello, everybody. It's, uh, it's an honor and a pleasure to be here at Aspen, um, and I know we're all going to have a great time for the next few days, um, and a fascinating 30 minutes ahead of us, because it really is fantastic to be able to welcome Dr. Monica Juma. As Anya said, she's held many posts in the Kenyan government, and also had a very distinguished career as an international diplomat, and would appear to be a great survivor, because you were defense minister under the previous President Kenyatta, and now you're a national security advisor to the incoming President William Ruto, and um, they weren't on the same side <laughs> in this election, so how did you manage to make the transition? Well, thank you very much, Sarah, and I just want to thank the organizers for inviting me. It's the first time a Kenyan is sitting in Aspen, uh, at least in this beautiful part of the world, so <laughs> very, very delighted to be among us, this distinguished crowd. For the first time, I saw Joseph Mir, who we looked to as we were students of international relations. So thank you very much. Um, Sarah, I, that question should go to the president, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> and I don't think it's unusual to have crossovers. So I'm just one of those. How much difference will it make to international relations with Kenya, to US relations with Kenya, this change of presidency, though? It was widely celebrated last year when there was a peaceful transfer of power after a pretty narrow election, and uh, William Ruto took over the presidency. Will that involve any significant change for the US and other Kenyan allies? Well, the change has been that uh, we are on a road to deepening that relationship, and you, I think, very lucky to have Meg Whitman there as the ambassador. Um, and so we've had a lot of engagement since President Ruto came in. So we are pleased that it is a continuation in terms of uh, uh, nurturing that relationship within a very structured, uh, it's very structured. We have a bilateral strategic dialogue. It is very well defined across several sectors, security, uh, economy, trade and investment, people to people relations. So we are seeing greater cooperation and deepening of relations. And of course, Kenya has long been a US ally. It's the most stable democracy in East Africa, you've got a dynamic and growing economy, all of which looks incredibly positive, but at the same time surrounded by potentially devastating conflicts and dealing with the, the terrible effects of a very severe drought throughout the region, threatening up to 20 million people with uh, hunger over the coming years, which also demonstrates the climate vulnerability that Kenya is facing. So it's a, it's a long and rather depressing list, but if you had to pick the biggest national security challenge that Kenya is facing. Could you name one? Well, like most of the world, of course, terrorism is one of the biggest threats, you know. Uh, we have next to us um, Al-Shabaab and uh, a growing network between Al-Shabaab and other international terrorist organizations. And in a situation of fragility and the threat to state collapse within the neighborhood, that has the potential to provide the environment for recruiting, for uh, training, for deploying, for planning uh, terrorist actions. So, top of my head, terrorism is the greatest threat. Um, and Al Shabaab operating in Somalia, obviously. There are Kenyan troops there at the moment as part of an international force to try and counter Al Shabaab. But troops are being withdrawn, another 3,000 will leave by the end of September. They will be completely withdrawn by the end of 2024. There are some inside Somalia warning that they think the country's not ready. Do you think Somali Defense Forces are ready to take on this challenge alone? It's a big challenge, and Somalia has been without a government for more than three decades. So the threat uh, in terms of capabilities are real, you know, and there's been a lot of discussions. Um, Linda here will tell you that this is a live file in the UN Security Council. Those of us near have been urging and uh, encouraging that this uh, withdrawal be condition-based. Uh, but we have also been calling for cooperation and partnership in order to build the capacity of the Somali state. This is really crucial because if we don't have a state that can provide public safety and security, that can provide uh, social services, that can take away and recover the population from the grip of the Al-Shabaab, then uh, all the investment we've made in the last couple of years could be lost just by that withdrawal. And that is why we've been making contact with partners to try and think through 
what a stabilization program for Somalia could look like. We believe it's not expensive. We believe it can be done. And part of it is really to boost and to provide some good quantum for state capability to function. So what would you be asking of anybody you meet here in order to help provide that? Because of course, Al-Shabaab have, uh, have launched attacks inside Kenya. They are capable of operating internationally. They, they, they pose a, a threat beyond their own borders. What would you be asking the international community to do to try and prepare for this moment at the end of 2024 when the international forces will be gone? Well, the first one is really to um, provide resources. Uh, Somali operations and support have been very um, poorly supported generally. Um, and the stabilization can take a part in terms of focusing on certain key actors, uh, sectors. For example, it is crucial that the state has the, has the capacity to hold territories that have been taken away. Um, there has been a lot of focus uh, towards creating the national army with all sorts of challenges to that. Some of us feel that there, there needs to be investment in local public safety capabilities, policing functions, administrative functions, ability to provide uh, primary health care, ability to make sure that schools can function, markets can function, and so forth. Capacity to uh, collect and manage taxes, because we know Al-Shabaab lives off of taxing people either for protection and other, uh, and other services. And we believe that it is possible to have a program where the neighboring state, for example, Kenya, can offer, and we have done so, our institutions to boop up the capacity of uh, state um, functionaries <coughs> that can actually undertake all these functions quickly. As I've said, it is not expensive, but it is something, it's a conversation that we are not getting a lot of traction with. And that's becoming more urgent, presumably, as you're looking at 18 months hence, what could be a very dangerous situation in that it country. It is becoming very urgent. Uh, Again, to Admiral, yes. I think it's very important to understand that an investment in security is really investment in the prosperity of our people and, and, and countries. So it is urgent. We also believe that there is need to look at Al-Shabaab as a terrorist organization that can really deliver a lot of, uh, um, a, a lot of challenges and a lot of uh, violence and a lot of disruption to Somalia, but also to the neighborhood. And so within Nairobi, we've been for a long time campaigning for the listing of Al-Shabaab. And, and that is an important thing so that we can all deploy the range of instruments that can actually curtail their influence both within Somalia, but across uh, the, the region and beyond. The UK Defence Secretary, Ben Wallace, is, uh, is about to leave his post, which always means people can be a little bit more outspoken uh, when, they're, when they're leaving a job. And he said uh, the other day that one of his biggest fears for uh, international security is the UK and allies being drawn into a shooting war in Africa as Al-Qaeda or affiliates like Al-Shabaab are threatening the future of nation states. And he said he was particularly worried about Somalia. Is that an exaggerated fear that Western allies could be drawn into a shooting war in Africa because of what's happening there? Well, unfortunately, it's not very far away. The effects of what is happening in Somalia or Sudan today um, can reach out here very quickly. So it's not far away and we have to pay attention. Do you think the US is paying attention to this? The US has been paying very close attention to Somalia and we have been working very closely with the US in Somalia. But I think we need a global view, for example. We don't feel that there is a, a look at the region holistically. You know, there is a tendency to focus on country by country. But the threats, if you look at them, they are interlinked. So we are looking at conflict formations. We are looking at uh, risk portfolios that are rel related to one another across the entire theater. And so we're talking about countries but we are also talking about the Indian Ocean, uh, so that we can look at the Indian Ocean reign as part of that theater of interest that we should be looking at at all times. And you mentioned Sudan, which we should talk about as well, but just so I clearly understand what you're saying. So in Somalia, you have an Al-Shabaab um, Islamic terrorist insurgency. In Sudan, what's happened in the last four months is 
quite different. You have an, a, a, an attempted coup going on there with a paramilitary force taking on the government army. What, what are the, 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 what's the commonality there that you're talking about that we should see it uh, more holistically? What we have seen with terrorism anywhere in the world is that they take advantage of ungoverned spaces. They take advantage of crisis. And so when you have a threat, a situation like the one evolving in Sudan, where the state is actually under the threat of collapse, complete state collapse and fragmentation, where in fact we are having fighting groups from beyond Sudan, all the way being drawn from the Sahel, all the way uh, to, the, to the end of the Sahel, as we, we hear. So we are talking about a transnational force that is not necessarily under the control of even the belligerents. Um, and, and we are seeing a, an appetite to create those linkages into the Sahel. We know we already have terrorist groups there. We know we have them in uh, DR Congo, Eastern DR Congo. We know the Central African Republic is very fragile. Uh, we know there is a connection between Al-Shabaab and Northern Mozambique. And so I think we have to look at this as interconnected theaters. And all, of, all the time, these actors are drawing on each other, whether it is in terms of ideology, whether it is in terms of fighting forces, and whether it is in terms of the planning and the execution of their plans to attack the various uh, countries and people or societies. We have a, a, a very well-connected and very well-informed audience here, so I'm sure they know just how uh, awful the fighting in Sudan has been, and the UN Secretary General saying they're, just, they're on the brink of a, a full-scale civil war there. But what is it the rapid support forces want to achieve in Sudan, those who are taking on the government? Well, I don't know. You'd have to ask them. I don't <laughs> know. What, what is certain is that they are causing untold suffering, destruction. We know that uh, my president has actually uh, used a stronger word. He has referred to what is unraveling in Darfur as a genocide, and I think we need to pay attention. Uh, it seems to us, when you look at uh, Darfur today, uh, you begin to recall the scenes of Darfur in 2003. Mm -hmm. So I think we need to pay very close attention to what is going on in the Sudan. And I think this country cannot forget that the journey to 9-11 began in Sudan. Yeah. So I think it's very important to pay attention to what is going on there. So tw 20 years since we were talking about genocide in Darfur, and in that time there's been a UN mission yes. in Sudan, an African Union mission. How, how has it come to the point where things are almost as bad now as they were 20 years ago? I think it's, it, it is proof that we didn't do our jobs right. Something went wrong. Um, an AU mission, a UN mission, 15, 16 billion US dollars down the line, and you're talking about villages being ravaged down. You're talking about more than 270 refugees in Chad, tens of thousands in South Sudan, actually threatening another very fragile country. Same with CAR, Egypt uh, facing the same situation. Uh, it seems to me that there was something we didn't do right. And, and I think the big question that we must ask now is what went wrong and how can we engage in a manner that doesn't take us there in another decade. And what do you think that might be? Well, first of all, I think uh, there has been a lot of impunity with Sudan. And we have to pay attention to when people, when crimes are being committed, people have to be held to account. A lot of crimes are unfolding in Sudan. And a lot of times when we listen to people, uh, there is not clarity in calling out those crimes. And, uh, we are not just having cities destroyed, we are having civilians being war efforts, we are having women being raped repeatedly, we are having people being killed in Darfur, we are having villages being uh, razed to the ground. So, um, but uh, we haven't had a lot of condemnation, have we? Uh, or even call, instead, um, we are having belligerents who, in fact, um, obstructed uh, a process towards the aspiration of the Sudanese people, we are focusing on those. And a lot of conversations are around those two gentlemen or generals. Um, and I think we need to focus on the people and the aspiration of the Sudanese people for democratic governance. 
Talking about the generals, though, and accountability, General Hamdan, the leader of the RSF, he was warned by the United States that he would face consequences if he tried to seize power in Sudan, and he hasn't. Nothing has happened. There have been no sanctions, no attempt to punish him for doing exactly what he was warned not to do. That's why Senator Chris Coons is urging a comprehensive set of sanctions should be imposed on this coup leader, but the Biden administration doesn't seem ready to do that. Well, I wouldn't answer for the Biden administration as well. But what, but what do you think about the fact that there I have been no consequences? <laughs> what I can say from Nairobi, it is very, very clear that the crisis in Sudan, in fact, it's not one crisis. There are a number of crises that are unfolding in Sudan. And the first thing that we need to do is to decouple those crises so that we do not have a situation where we cannot resolve them because we haven't agreed on all of them. The first crisis that is urgent is the humanitarian crisis. And so conversations around getting humanitarian assistance in Sudan, <laughs> into Sudan is urgent and now. The numbers of people affected and impacted. So we have thought that the decisions around creating humanitarian corridors and securing humanitarian assets to make sure that assistance gets through where it is most needed must be the first a, a set of responsibility for a number of actors that are engaged in this. And uh, Martin Griffith, OCHA, has been leading initi in this initiative, but they have been receiving a lot of difficulties of access. So there needs to be some serious conversations <coughs> to demand observation, at least of the international humanitarian law, in the event that we cannot get the stopping of the war so that the humanitarian action can proceed. Secondly, is the question around silencing the guns. It is absolutely essential that the war comes to an end if this country is going to turn around and that that happens quickly. And that is why we believe that the JEDA initiative uh, was important in terms of trying to secure some degree of the cessation of hostilities. We think that the cessation of hostilities should be permanent so that it can allow for the recovery and normalization, hopefully, of the Sudan. But the third and very important component is the political process, which in fact was subverted. Uh, we know of the revolution. We know that the Sudanese people had clearly defined their aspiration for democratic dispensation. This was uh, subverted and it requires, we need to reset back to it. There's not a lot of, there's a lot of debate because somewhat the two sides do not like this idea that the civilians can take charge, but this is about Sudan and the people of Sudan have a right to determine how they wish to be governed. And uh, we take the view from Nairobi that this is urgent. Any of these uh, issues should be taken up. They can run concurrently, they can reinforce one another, but they should not be clamped together because that means if one doesn't move, then everything else stalls and people continue suffering. To what extent does Kenya now see itself as a regional leader when it comes to these kind of things? I mean, you're the, you're the most stable democracy, the most prosperous country in the region. Is it your responsibility to get involved in each one of these conflicts and attempt to try and find some kind of resolution? Historically, we have always uh, availed ourselves to try and solve these types of situations. And uh, in Sudan, as in DR Congo and Somalia, we have, uh, we have not had any choice. The president and the administration feels they have a duty, a duty in the region. And so we have uh, um, offered ourselves. The president is chairing the IGAD Quartet. He has been in engagement with all the neighborhood of Sudan. And I think uh, we are uh, not moving as quickly as we would wish, but I think there is an agreement of the imperative to cohere, to coordinate around the region in order that we can drive towards uh, the ending of this conflict and the restoration of uh, the process uh, of peace building, but importantly of governance by the civilian dispensation in Sudan. Um, and, and looking at slightly wider um, international relations, Kenya, like a lot of Africa, uh, is being wooed, I would say, quite heavily by the US at the moment. Um, America's making a huge effort in Africa, and President Biden uh, himself said he's all, all in on Africa, all in with 
Africa, but it's, it's nakedly transparent, isn't it, that the reason this effort is being made in Africa is to counter Chinese influence in the global south. Does it matter why it is that the US is trying to establish better relations, putting in more money, paying more attention to Africa? Well, I think um, the US effort is not, uh, is historical. I mean, US has a long history with many countries on the continent. Um, I think uh, any wooing of Africa at this time is right. If you look at the geo uh, strategic issues, and let me just um, speak to climate, uh, climate action. Um, if we are going to move towards net zero, urgent as it is, I think the best way to do this is to look at uh, the global south and in particular to Africa. Because you are looking at the, 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 the diversified set of uh, resources uh, that are critical for green growth, whether you're talking about uh, um, e-minerals, whether you're talking about renewable energy, or, or whether you're talking about the carbon sinks and things like that. So it is rational. Uh, to, re to look at Africa in terms of uh, the climate action. Um, uh, if you're talking about trade and investment, you're talking about uh, a region that is 1.2 billion people, young people, so it's a big market, and it provides uh, opportunity both for the continent but also for America and any other uh, region that wishes to engage for investment and prosperity. So. I don't think it's about wooing, it's about looking at opportunities and trying to, to leverage those opportunities. And is it, I mean, Kenya looks as though it's pivoting away from China a bit at the moment. Billions of dollars were spent building infrastructure projects that were lent by China, but now you're, 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 you're trapped with that debt as global interest rates are rising, and President Ruto has said he, he won't be looking for Chinese investment for any more projects like this at a time when you're welcoming in the Americans. Is that a political pivot, or is that just a coincidence that that's happening now? Well, it's, it, it's, um, it's being pragmatic. Um, if you have a huge debt, you need to deal with it, okay? Uh, and that's not just a Kenyan problem. I think it's a global <laughs> problem, and we could all have the statistics for everywhere. So I, I think what we are doing is uh, uh, we are looking at uh, what are the next steps. Um, we are making very tough decisions. President Ruto is making very, very tough decisions because he has pronounced himself around reducing borrowing. Um, in terms of climate action, he's been uh, on the forefront of arguing for the right architecture because there should not be a contradiction between responding to crisis emergencies and development. They are not mutually exclusive, and it is possible to go on the green growth path uh, without necessarily, and actually you can't do it on, on, on our balance sheet. It is not possible, not with the current infrastructure, financing infrastructure that we are having. So I think it's a matter of looking at the moment in history and asking the questions. Do we have the infrastructure to respond to our future, to the current challenges and to the opportunities that the, 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 the context we live in provides? Um, and that answering that question uh, will take you to a different place in terms of changing the infrastructure of development as we know it today. And it does feel as though we're at uh, a major tipping point or inflection point globally, and we know the Biden administration has nailed its colors very firmly to the mast over Ukraine, but internationally saying that they're worried about the rise of autocracy and very ready to uh, support and defend democracy. What does that mean for Kenya and your region? Well, um, for Kenya, it's very clear what it means. Um, we see our future and our prosperity being um, uh, best realized within a democratic dispensation. And we have been on a path of deepening our democratic credentials, as you indicated. But we also know that we cannot realize that prosperity <coughs> as an island. And so the region matters. And the fragility in the region is not a good thing for our democratic prosperity. And so there is need to engage. And that is part of the raison d'etre, why we are engaged in the region to try and and contribute to the pursuit of peace and security, but also to contribute towards democratic, uh, uh, deepening democratic uh, 
practices and governance. And so we have all manner of uh, collaboration with <coughs> our neighborhood. But I think this has got to be contextualized globally. Democracy is under duress globally. And I think we have to ask fundamental questions around how can democracy be uh, uh, linked to improved livelihoods of people? Uh, how can we focus also on socioeconomic rights? How can we uh, engage in development that supports improvement of value of life? So really there's a fundamental question around how do we incentivize for democratic practice? Because most democratic proponents would assume that what you describe comes along with a democracy, but you're saying it, it cannot be taken for granted and people need to be, need to be incentivized to understand the value of the democracy. That's true, I think that is true. And, and let me just take an example uh, with, in relation to what you asked me, what is our greatest risk, terrorism. We have seen ter terrorism, terrorist agents, take advantage of democratic spaces, protected democratic spaces, schools, churches, to recruit, to train, to deploy. So how do we protect these spaces so that the freedom of association, the freedom of um, areas of worship, protection of areas of worship is not subverted for insidious, uh, for insidious um, uh, aims and activities such as uh, terrorism. Similarly, we are having a young population on the African continent. How do we make sure that we can move, we can drive development that offers employment, dignified jobs, you know, and good value of life. Because if you don't do that, then these young people become the bands that are ready to be recruited, uh, to be gangs, to get into cells, uh, terrorist cells and things like that. So we have to link consciously our development to democratic credentials. Otherwise, we run a risk of having growth rates that do not translate into value of life, good value of life. And you, you identify terrorism as the greatest problem now, but the region is already suffering the drought that we already mentioned as a result of climate change, a decade, a, 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 a drought the worst in four decades, and we fear with more to come. With the movements of people, with the uh, poverty that that will bring, will, it be, will you reach a point where actually climate change is more of a threat to security than terrorism? Climate threat is a, it's a very, it's an existential threat. And I think it's, again, it's not a Horn of Africa problem. It is a global threat to all of us. And when you look at the figures in terms of the emissions, it really doesn't matter that America's emissions are going, uh, are lessening or Europe because the frontier markets are emitting <coughs> in, in larger percentages. And when you look at cumulatively, the trajectory is raising. Uh, and so we are really not within the margins that science tells us we have to be in. So climate crisis is a big, big threat. It is impacting security. It is impacting the ability of countries to drive development because when you start transferring your money from your development kitty to respond to emergencies, then you're having a problem. Um, and if it is combined with uh, drought, lack of rainfall, which means then you don't have food security, it means you run into emergency situation. It means uh, you cannot service your debts. It also puts a lot of pressure on your fiscal space. Then it, it translates into insecurity, not just for the individuals, but for countries. And that's, well, we know that's a very real coming threat. I feel that we've, um, we've probably thoroughly depressed everybody on this um, opening <laughs> night with a, with no. a run around all of, all of these um, very, very worrying conflicts and problems, which feels unfair because Kenya is really a remarkable success story in the region as well. This was, and like Anya said when we started, this was not meant to depress anyone. <laughs> Let me turn it around. <laughs> Let me turn it around. In this region, with, in spite of all that we are having, um, there is a lot of possibilities. A lot of possibilities to start with in terms of climate action. I have said, we are sitting in a region of diversified assets, ready that can actually be invested upon to reduce both the emissions in terms of decarbonization, but also 
to build resilience in these countries, to provide what you are talking about, whether it is job opportunities, whether it is in terms of uh, um, uh, quality of life, food security, and so forth and so forth. But I am also sitting in a country where we believe in digital transformation. And here is another area for this continent, just, not just for Kenya, in terms of the possibility for transforming societies, digital transformation, Silicon Savannah we have out there. Anybody that has been in Kenya will know the bubbliness of that country in terms of the technological advancement and, and, and the, the possibilities. So herein, again, huge opportunities for not just American companies, but for everybody to actually drive the new world, which is uh, digital in, in character. But we are also having uh, the possibility for the democratic, deepening of the democratic credentials. It is true we are having fragility, but hey, that is the journey that every country has to go to walk. And so I don't think it's about uh, these difficulties are not really overwhelming, they are overwhelming to us as individuals, but I think that is why I appeal for global partnerships, solidarity, so that we can all work together because a stable, peaceful Africa is good for the world. Thank you, Juma. Thank you. A stable, 